Hey, coming up on Windows Weekly, I'm filling in for Leo one more week, but Paul Therott is here, and we're going to talk about whether Nokia and Microsoft are not only partnering, but maybe merging. Uh, we'll also discuss how Zune is starting to dominate iTunes, and Paul assures us the cake was never a lie. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 195, recorded February 10th, 2011. Zoom dominates iTunes. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. And by GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with the leader in remote support software, GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit GoToAssist.com slash Windows. And by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com, offer code WINDOWS. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything you need to know about Windows and some stuff about Microsoft, too, just in general, with Paul Therott, news editor for Windows IT Pro, the man in charge of WinSuperSite.com, and don't forget, the author of Windows Phone Secrets. You won't forget that, will you, Paul? I will never forget it, and for all the right reasons. Uh, it is good to be back with you. you thank you. You too. I, I'm going to I'm gonna be looking down today, I think, because I've got the camera mounted on some other screen, and I've tried to prop my laptop up. Well, here, I'll, just, I'll crouch. Yeah, I'll, I'll crouch be, down a little so that there we go. it fits. There. <laughs> it's yeah. That's all right. All right. Uh, well, if you're looking for Leo Laporte, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he is just leaving the most southerly city in the world. New Ush Orleans? Ushayo, Argentina. Oh, that place. Or some, something like that. I'm probably is mangling. That, is that on that little triangular island that's on the bottom of Argentina? Yeah, what is Is that the Cape of Good Hope? That's got to be a disputed territory. <laughs> it's probably, yeah. It's it, got to be. It's probably like the British... Liechtenstein and Argentina all claim dominion. I was thinking Chile, but yeah, British probably. <laughs> Certainly. <Just> random. <laughs> Liechtenstein's one colonial property. <laughs> and yeah, right. They're one ship in that uh, vast Navy fleet that they own. In any case, while Leo's gone, I'll be filling in for him uh, this week and next week on Windows Weekly. Then he'll, mm -hmm. he'll be back uh, next week. So we've got some uh, we've got some good stuff to talk about. Just Just today, actually, fresh news about Internet Explorer 9. Right, so the release candidate is out, and this is the last uh, major milestone, at least, the pre-release milestone before the final version. So uh, if you grab this today and take a look at it, what you see is probably going to be what you get in the final version whenever that's released, sometime in the months ahead. And, um, you know, it's, it's more of the same in many ways, which is mostly good news. And then they've made a bunch of changes based on feedback from the beta, which had come out in September. And uh, I would say mostly it's refinements and tweaks, with a few exceptions, perhaps. Um, you know, there's been some UI stuff, which is kind of interesting. To me, the, very, the biggest thing, and this is kind of hidden, is uh, Microsoft had previously announced a feature for IE9 called tracking protection. Uh, this is their attempt to address the do not track feature that I think it was the FTC that was calling for. And when they originally announced it, I thought, or, and I, I wrote that, you know, I felt like their approach was wrong because they were basically going to enable this functionality in the browser, but they weren't going to enable it to actually prevent anything from tracking you. And that to make that happen, you would have to download third-party white and blacklists, I guess blacklists essentially. And I, to me, that was just putting the onus on, on the user. And I didn't understand that. And I complained about it. And in the RC version, this feature has been enabled. And sure enough, there are third-party uh, lists that you can download. But it has some functionality built in now where it will actually look at the sites that you visit and examine which of them are tracking you as you browse around the web. And eventually, there will be a a line that is crossed, you know, it's, it's like a cookie that jumps across so many sites or whatever, and then they'll just automatically block it if you want to uh, disable that functionality. So 
uh, that's an excellent feature that you can enable in this browser and you can check it out and see how it works and all that. So I've got it running. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But I think that might actually address, uh, you know, the needs here and, and the complaint that I had. So that, that's good news. Well, and that's and then, one, of, one of the weird things is we've got Firefox has their header uh, yeah. for uh, Do Not Track that they just put into their beta. No mm -hmm. script for Firefox has their own header for Do right. Not Track. Chrome well, and, has got, got their own functionality that they're putting into their beta. And so now we've got Microsoft's with a third one. What's interesting about Microsoft's is it doesn't require the advertisers to participate, which Chrome's and Firefox's I, do. Which I am so excited about. And this is exactly what I was talking about. You know, in other words, I, I didn't quite put it in this kind of an allegation, but, you know, Google and Microsoft, obviously, and, and uh, Firefox, too, to a lesser degree through Google, all have their own advertising interests, right? You know, these mm -hmm. companies that are making browsers... You know, when you think about it, a lot of the money that they're generating, um, if only implicitly through the browser, comes from these tracking ads. So now you're going to add features to the browsers that block the tracking ads or, tra you know, I guess uh, tracking sites. Um, interesting, <laughs> you know, a little bit contradictory. Um, but yeah, Microsoft's done the right thing here. I, I think by automatically examining where you go and what tracks you and then disabling those things that hop across too many sites, perfect. Uh, that's exactly right. And you can modify... Uh, how this thing works, you can tell it to be more aggressive in its blocking or less aggressive. I think it's a it's a nice little feature, so it's good. You know, I think from a, uh, anyone who's been using the i9 beta is going to want to grab this thing. Uh, but I think uh, Windows users in general should probably check this one out. It looks good. I've only had it for a little while, so I can't claim that it's, um, you know, reliable over a period of time or anything like that yet. But what I've seen so far... Uh, looks good. There's also an ActiveX filtering uh, feature that hasn't gotten a lot of press yet. And this one is also done right because ActiveX controls are useful, but if they, they can be used on malicious sites or on uh, sites that just don't know any better to do dangerous things uh, to your PC. So if you enable ActiveX filtering in IE9, it will actually block ActiveX controls for all sites automatically. And then as you hit sites that have ActiveX controls that you need or want to use or, and you trust the site, you can actually enable them only on a site-by-site -site basis. So that's another great little security feature that you can just kind of flip a switch on. It just works. And I think that addresses one of the primary complaints about IE in general, just that it's the one browser that obviously works with ActiveX controls. So with this with this uh, release candidate, we're now feature complete, right? There might be little, little bug fixes here and there, but this... This is everything you're going to get. You have you go to beautyoftheweb.com to download it? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's one of the sites. You can go to ietestdrive.com or also microsoft.com slash ie. Uh, all of those places will get you there. You have to have Windows Vista or Windows 7. And I should also note that it's better with Windows 7. If you haven't used uh, Internet Explorer 9 yet, there are some deep integration features with Windows 7 only around uh, pin sites and, you know, uh, the ability to use websites as, as if they were basically applications. You can pin them to the taskbar, the start menu, and so forth. Um, a lot of neat functionality there as well. And that, how long do you think between release candidate and, and, and official? Yeah, program? so Microsoft told me the final release was right around the corner. They used the phrase very, very soon, so that probably means about six months. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Microsoft is a slow-moving company. Uh, no, I think we've got that mix show coming up in mid-April, I think uh, April 16th, somewhere okay. around there. Yeah, That seems like the logical time to either release it at the show, at the opening of the show, or right before the show. Um, and so if you think about the time frame there, that's really only two months away, isn't it? So I think that's the... Uh, the logical time. That seems about the right amount of time to have this beta get beat on a little bit and give them a chance mm -hmm. to actually make some patches if they need to. Yeah, uh, and based on their trajectory so far, I mean, their plan, and they, they hit it and actually exceeded it, was they wanted to release some new milestone every seven to eight weeks. And uh, I didn't I didn't look at the calendar, but I think Mix is it's about eight weeks away, isn't it? <laughs> so, you know, that could be it. Yep, there you go. That, that would yeah. make sense. Yeah. And uh, And this is the great hope. For, for Microsoft, right? IE9 is the one that's their their best effort to turn around that declining number that we talked about last week to 56%. Yeah, I think that something interesting occurs when IE9 comes out because IE8 has obviously has done well and has worked for Microsoft in the sense that it has grown share. In fact, it has grown share faster than other browsers, including Chrome. Well, overall IE usage has gone down. So once they release something like IE9, uh, that gives them a chance to actually have two browsers that can go steady because I, I don't see IE8 actually dropping off a cliff when this thing comes out because 
businesses are deploying it as part of Windows 7. And they're not necessarily going to roll out IE9 immediately, if ever, or until the next version of the OS comes or some future data, whatever. So I think what we're going to see going forward as IE9 comes out is you're going to see a big uptick there for consumers. And then IE8 will kind of continue steadily along as well. So I, I, I think uh, this could be a year where Microsoft actually plateaus and hopefully, you know, hopefully for Microsoft, I guess, uh, even sees, you know, their overall share increasing. We're also seeing uh, another release, Service Pack 1 for Windows 7, as well as uh, Windows Server 2008 R2, right? That, those are those are released to OEMs? Yeah, so they really, so yeah, so the, the, this is actually the RTM release, and they also released it to OEMs, meaning they've shipped the code to their PC maker and server maker partners so that they can incorporate this code into their own products, right, out of the box. Um, there is a, sort of a stage release occurring. Uh, so on February 16th, which must be next week. Again, I don't have a calendar, so yeah, next week. Uh, Microsoft will release SP1 to uh, its volume license customers and also to MSDN and TechNet subscribers. So if mm -hmm. you want to check it out early and you're on those programs, you can get that. And then the public release, which is via Windows Update, Microsoft Update, you know, the manual downloads, and, and then also pre-installs on servers uh, will happen on February 22nd. And, you know, I, I think I've repeated this about a dozen times in the podcast over the months, but for Windows 7... This is not a big deal, right? Uh, there are some minor new features, none of which are particularly exciting. Um, lots of bug fixes and, and hot fixes, uh, function, or not functional, but just uh, bug fixes, essentially, security fixes and bug fixes, uh, most of which have already been released previously, right? So it's an aggregation of those uh, older fixes. But on the server side, this is a huge release. So for companies that are deploying Windows Server 2008 R2, this adds uh, some major functionality around uh, that system's virtualization features, um, both, uh, I don't want to get too far into this, but both for VDI and for uh, what they call um, virtual, uh, virtual machine density, meaning uh, the number of machine, uh, virtual machines you can add to the same hardware without impacting performance. And it's something, I think, I believe it's a 40% gain um, over, you know, the previous version just with R, uh, R2 Hyper-V. So big deal, you know, for people doing virtualization on the server side. What are, what are some of the minor features on Windows 7, just as an example? Because I know there's always yeah. somebody out there who's like, well, then, <laughs> who, what, who what do you it? mean yeah, by yeah. minor? Okay. So uh, they've updated the remote desktop services client, which is, was needed for one of those, uh, uh, v, for the VDI functionality I talked about called Remote uh, FX. They are adding better support for third-party federation services, which probably means nothing to anybody. But uh, federation is where you uh, combine uh, the technical infrastructure for two companies in a, in a trust model. So if you have... Uh, to active directory domains, for example, you could have a federation between them. Um, in the Microsoft world, we use federation to uh, combine a hosted exchange server with an on-premises exchange server, so you can, you know, uh, have some users on each or, you know, interact between them, uh, that kind of thing. What's the prime directive of the federation? Never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's trust. <laughs> and uh, better, uh, there's uh, improved HDMI audio device performance, apparently with certain yeah. HDMI-based uh, I have uh, run into this problem before with, with certain HDMI Yeah, so it's devices. a performance, so it's kind of a stuttering kind of yeah, a thing. Yeah, and, yeah. so apparently it fixes that. That only, uh, Microsoft says that impacted a small number of users, which probably means, you know, 20 to 25 million or something. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, right. I've never, per, small I, percentage I, is a big number. <laughs> yeah, of the 300 million people using Windows uh, 7. So, and then there's a, there was a fix for XPS document, uh, which I actually don't even recall what the details of that were, but uh, there were... Let me see if I can remember. There were some cases in which, I don't remember what it was. XPS is Microsoft's um, PDF type document infrastructure that's built into Windows that nobody uses. Uh, so let's not worry about that too much. And I think that's most of it. That's most of the stuff. So, you know, you can tell looking at that list, nothing particularly dramatic. Although maybe the HDMI if you have that issue. Yeah, and I, and I think... There's always, you know, everybody that listens to the show probably knows this. There's always that let's wait until SP1 to yeah. officially move on to Windows 7. We, do we expect <laughs> to see that again this time? No, there... I, I, no the, you know, having tracked this for years and years and years, we've looked, I've looked at this uh, for every version of Windows from Windows 2000, or every, I should say, business version of Windows, uh, from Windows 2000 to XP to, to Vista and to 7. And I can say with Windows 7 for the first time, um, corporate adoption happened and is happening very quickly, relatively quickly, you know, for that market, in the sense that when Vista came out, uh, there was a lot of talk about upgrading. 
Um, and then there was a lot of talk about waiting until SP1 for upgrading. And then there was just no more talk. And uh, businesses really just didn't upgrade in mass at all to Windows Vista. Um, I think because of that, partially, um, we see a much quicker adoption of Windows 7 right out of the gate uh, with businesses. And I think for businesses, they're lo they look at Windows 7 as an improved and tweaked and more refined version of Windows Vista, which is sort of what the SP1 release of these OSs achieves generally. So it took whatever that is, three, four years. But I think with Windows 7, they finally got it right. Now, I, I don't think this is a new trend. You know, I think when Windows 8 comes out, uh, businesses will wait, not necessarily for SP1, but just because they just upgraded to Windows 7, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to just keep upgrading. I mean, they, they tend to move more slowly to new OS releases. And but, that, I think people undercredited that as a reason for folks not moving from Windows XP to Vista is that, yep. you know, some people delayed moving to Windows XP and they and in their minds they had just, even if it was a year or two, just yeah. spent and, a and, lot you know, of money. Yeah, Th this gets better uh, with each Windows version in the sense that when you do a migration from some previous version of Windows to the new version, obviously those the technologies and the tools for that all get better every time. Um, but, you know, make no mistake, especially for larger environments, uh, migrating to a new OS with all of the application and device driver compatibility issues and all that stuff, the website compatibility issues for intranets and for partner sites, you know, for federated <laughs> partners and so forth. Um, it's a it's a it's a lot of work and it doesn't matter how good that stuff is. I mean, unless it's completely seamless, which I don't think it ever will be. That's the goal, you know, the, the no touch type migration. Um, you know, Windows 7 is at a good place. And I just think that for those companies who have migrated to Windows 7 already or are in the process of doing that, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna look forward to doing it again, no matter how good it was, you know. Are we gonna see a boxed version? Virgil is asking this in the chat room uh, with SP1 included. That is a good question. Um, I don't actually have any information about that, but based on what Microsoft has done in the past, yeah, I would think so. And I don't think there's a big impetus at Microsoft to, you know, go to Best Buy and say, you know, please send us back all those boxes and we'll replace them with SP1 right, boxes. Right. Uh, I, there's no real reason for that. But, you know, the other thing to note too is, you know, when you have a, a an installed Windows 7 system and you upgrade to SP1 I don't know if dynamically is the right term, but, you know, on the fly. In other words, you just go to Windows Update and you say, yes, I would like to install uh, SP1. Uh, interactively, maybe is the better word. You know, that installer will look at your system and it will see which updates you've already installed. And if there's no reason to download and install those updates, again, it won't. So the size of the download and the length of time it will take to make the download will vary from machine to machine. If you have a brand new Windows box and you haven't applied any updates, you know, the download for that thing would be humongous relatively speaking, and would take longer. So, you know, the experience of upgrading is not all that horrible. Anyway, um, I don't think too many people buy Windows in a box anyway, but if you were to buy a new Windows PC and bring it home, you would have some Windows updates right away, I'm sure. That's just the way life works, unfortunately. But if you if you were to run that one series of Windows updates and then install SP1, it would probably be a pretty quick procedure, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, somewhere in that time frame. All right, I want to move on to uh, talking about the increasingly weird, silly, but probably in some <laughs> cases true rumors about Nokia and Microsoft. Uh, but yeah. I want to first thank our, our sponsor, GoToAssist Express. If you're in tech support, if you've got people that you support who are going to be installing service packs and new versions of browsers and then calling you, hey, I, I did something wrong. I'm not sure what I did. How do I fix this? You want to look into GoToAssist Express, even even if it's just your parents or your relatives, uh, but your clients too rely on you for fast and reliable service, and you need the best remote software available because you you can't afford to fly out to every client. You can't afford to even take the time to walk upstairs to every client. GoToAssist Express saves you time, saves you money. Uh, recently named the worldwide market leader in remote support by Frost and Sullivan, an industry analyst group which focuses on this sector. Here's how it works. Start your sessions with just one click. It's just like all the services from Citric. You send the person you're helping an instant email invitation. It works on PCs or Macs. doesn't matter which of you has which. Uh, then you share your screen, and they can share theirs. So you can see the same problem they're seeing, including an integrated live chat. So you can talk them through what's going on. Uh, you diagnose the problem. As you access their desktop remotely and GoToSys tells you what software is running on their machine, what the operating system is, security software, all the things you need to know to be able to fix their problem. And then you're in there and you fix it. 
And you can tell them what you're doing while you're doing it. You maybe give them some tips on how to make sure something like that doesn't happen in the future. Uh, but you access the files on their computer. You can transfer files from your computers to theirs. It really will help you solve tech problems quickly uh, and help clients even when they're away from their computer. As long as they, they've got you connected, they can go get coffee if they want. So go to Assist, brought to you by Citrix, and all the data exchanged during your session is 128-bit encrypted end-to-end. -end. So it is completely secure. Free customer service available 24-7. Try it out. Go to assist.com slash windows is the place to go. Try it for free. I just decided that for 30 days. We'll give it to you for free. <laughs> go to assist.com slash windows, and we thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. You wield tremendous power. Thank you. I hope Leo doesn't get mad that I did that. <laughs> I think he has to understand, you know, the rules of secession and so forth. That's right. Succe succession, 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 not secession. Not secession. <laughs> Whole different <laughs> thing there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the rumor mill uh, has been churning for a while. Nokia's got their capital markets announcement, which is a yearly, uh, it's a yearly announcement, right? That they do uh, where they, they sort of lay out their plans for folks who are going to invest in Nokia. And Stephen Elop, former Microsoft VP, is now the right. CEO of Nokia. He's going to talk tomorrow and everybody's on tenterhooks about what he's going to say about Windows Phone 7. If anything, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, because He may come out and say, you know what, we're just firing all, this, all those executives you knew we were going to fire. And that's it. I, I, Thanks, everybody. Wouldn't it be something if he came out and said, you know, I was at Microsoft when they made that thing and... Uh, yeah, we're going with Android. I mean, you know, think about the the ramifications of a statement like that. So anything is possible. Um, I would just say from a, from sort of a background standpoint, you know, the one thing a lot of people don't uh, maybe know or understand is that internally at Microsoft, there are a lot of debates that go on, whether it's in the executive staff or the, you know, the, the rank and file and so forth. And the memos are exchanged via email and so forth. And, and, and many of them are very strongly worded and, and very blunt in, in ways that you just wouldn't expect from a company like Microsoft. You think of it as this, because it is a huge conglomerate and slow moving and all that, but a lot of passion in there. And um, Microsoft executives in particular are often uh, famous for, you know, these memos, you know, that often get leaked. And when I say leaked, I mean, they're leaked with like the air quotes, you know, uh, leaked so, uh, to the press. Um, so Stephen Elop, as a former Microsoft executive, has had his own little leak this week where he, in a letter to Nokia employees, described the dire situation that they were in. And one of the weird uh, things about Nokia is that they still have commanding market share, right, in the, in the smartphone market, in the cell phone market. Yeah, worldwide, they're number one. Number one with a bullet, <laughs> you know. The bullet may be but, going the wrong way, but the bullet may, that's yeah. yes, absolutely. A bullet, it's a bullet hole, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> the bullet but, passed uh, through the body. But they're still yeah. standing up. They're still, exactly, but they're falling. And it, it's very interesting that uh, over the years, as I've written about this company, I, there's been this handful of people. They tend to live in Finland, which is interesting. But you know, they they've written me to complain. You know, why you sit down in this company? They're still dominant and all that. And um, you know, I, it's obvious to me and to, to so many people that. This is a company that is in free fall, even though, like we said, they, they still have this kind of dominant share, but uh, they're clearly on the way out because they just don't have the technology. They don't have the products. They don't have the capability to ship products in any kind of meaningful time frame. I mean, it's well, been and they're, no long, they're no longer number one in smartphones, which is where all of the market is going. Yes. So he has written, uh, Stephen Elop has, uh, this letter internally, a very Microsoftian letter, um, about this very point that, you know, we've lost market share, we've lost mind share, we've lost time, and uh, questioning, you know, how we got to this point as Nokia and, and what what we can do. And, he, and the phrase he used that I thought was beautiful was, you know, Nokia, our platform is burning. Um, you know, another platform is a, a kind of a dual meaning there, I think, but, um, you know, they are, in other words, just acknowledging that we are on the, on the way down. So on February 11th, this company is uh, hopefully going to announce its plans. It, it, will, it will discuss its new strategy. And the take on this is that many people believe they will adopt Windows 7 and become some kind of a special partner with Microsoft, which I think would be an interesting outcome. I suppose other possibilities would include adopting Android. Um, they could adopt neither one. I mean, they, they, you could simply say, look, I think we do have good technology here somewhere. We just haven't seen it on the market yet, and we're going to bring that to market. I mean, Although are, Google are, VP Vic Gundotra on Twitter said, two turkeys do not make an eagle, and everyone is... You know, it's kind of cryptic, but everyone's assuming that he's referring to Microsoft and Nokia getting together, and that would imply that they passed on Android. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, right, that's the rumor. I, I think that uh, some alliance with Microsoft is the most likely. But as others have pointed out, the problem for Nokia is that it has always uh, set its own destiny in the sense that it has its own platform or platforms uh, that it has used in the past. And if they uh, join up with Microsoft, um, they lose control of their destiny, right? And they become just another OEM. So there are companies like Samsung and HTC and LG that make Windows mobile or windows phone devices um and they also all make other devices including android devices um this is not a, a particularly enticing a place to be from nokia's standpoint so the speculation is there must be something else going on right that uh, as a former microsoft executive uh, steve nelop obviously has inroads with the company and you know maybe there's going to be some special arrangement do they become the exclusive carrier for windows phone which would be kind of interesting do they um, you know, that's have, not possible, is it? Microsoft wouldn't do that. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. But that's why, and that, and actually, that's that leads me to my own little bit of speculation. And this is based on absolutely nothing. But I think it's time for both of these companies to do something very bold. You know, we've talked here on the podcast over the past many months now that you know Microsoft is just they're just not you know going for it, and what they're they're not making any bold moves. And I think that a bold move here would be for these companies to simply combine and uh, to merge. And wow. uh, get rid of all that stuff. And, uh, you know, Nokia could be, it would have favored nation status, there's no doubt about it. I don't think they should get rid of the other uh, partners. But then again, you have to think if this were to happen, those partners would probably leave of their own volition anyway. Um, whether from real or imagined uh, slights, you know, because Nokia would have special access or whatever. Um, I'd like to see something like that happen because I think there's, you know, Microsoft has reached the point where it needs to send a message to the market that is really serious. And uh, starting over with a new smartphone platform is, is one thing, but I, I think they really need to go for it in a big way. And I think this is one of the ways they could do that. It'd be an interesting um, link up, and I think uh, maybe a good one as well. Well, if you look at what's going on, it's pretty clear that whether he makes the announcement tomorrow or not, Windows Phone 7 is the only option Nokia has got at this point. So if we take Vic's Twitter <laughs> to mean Android's out, uh, well, it they, could be more of a, uh, well. They've retired yeah. Mego. Uh, yeah. they, they've said that they're not going to finish development on the only Mego phone they had in development. And now, theoretically, they could start rolling out Mego, which is their own smartphone operating system on other platforms. But that would mean starting over from scratch. Uh, Windows Phone 7 is there. It's ready. Stephen Elops, a former Microsoft VP, it all just seems to make sense. But to make that leap and say, and then they would merge, that seems that seems like a bigger leap. How... How is oh, that? It, it's, it's a big leap. And yeah. I, I, I want to be clear, this is nothing but speculation. Sure, sure. Uh, and the reason, I, the reason I came to that was um, not even so much from the common sense nature of that kind of a link-up, but rather from the fact that both of these companies need something big, right? Uh, Windows Phone has gotten off to an okay start, I guess. Um, you know, Nokia is not doing well, but they still have this dominant market share. And they also have lots of, com uh, lots of customers who love them outside of the United States. And this would be an interesting way for Microsoft to gain market share, I think, from, a, from, from people who would look for the Nokia engineering that they love so much and then combined. And, and Nokia would probably have some kind of um, influence over the software design as well, of course, right? Because they would become part of the same entity. So I, I think it's just an exciting possibility. You know, Nokia is a company that has lost its way, but arguably so is Microsoft. So um, I just, I, you know, it's cute to say two turkeys don't make an eagle. Um, and I don't know that, you know, the genetics of that, uh, Vic. <laughs> it might, but... it, 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 exactly. <laughs> it, it, it may be possible to make an eagle out of two turkeys. We, have, we don't know. Right. I mean, who can say? Although I'm... Vic, working at Google, they may have tried. <laughs> Vic used to work at Microsoft, by the way, so. Uh, well, there is a yeah. little background on this because there was a Nokia uh, executive, and I can't remember which one now, who had said previously about a Siemens acquisition of a handset maker, two turkeys don't make an eagle. So Vic is sort of parroting that back. Sure. At well, that, that, that makes sense because uh, I don't believe Google's ever had an original idea. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no you're, you're, you're thinking of Bing. That They're the harsh. ones who copy Microsoft. No, I'm just that was harsh. Uh, yes. So uh, <laughs> I, here's what I think. Yes. Nokia announces tomorrow. We're going back to our roots. Galoshes and other rubber products. I like where your head's at. Because, yeah, it's funny. You know, uh, there are a lot of tech companies 
I was going to say mostly outside of the United States, but that's probably not strictly true, um, that had their start doing something completely pedestrian, you know. Um, Commodore, I think, was like that. HP, if I'm not mistaken, was like that. Um, but outside of the United States, you know, Nintendo is a good example of that right, kind of thing. Right. It's, it's funny, a lot of these companies... IBM? Yeah, yeah. Um, you go back and look at their, their uh, less than austere beginnings. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, something slightly different, yeah. <laughs> galoshes is a good market for Finland, so... Yeah, everybody needs galoshes. <laughs> and the smartphones might go away. Right. All right, uh, HP uh, is also part of this conversation, right? Because now this is interesting. Some of the carriers have been saying, please, 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 Nokia, do not pick Android. It will make them too dominant, and we'll be left with just Android and iOS. We need some other competitors. HP's over here waving their hands saying, hey, we, we own WebOS now. Uh, and they made an announcement rolling out two phones and a tablet. Yeah, HP and I would say RIM, too, is also over the sidelines saying, hey, don't forget about us. You right. Know? Um, I... You know, I've always felt bad about WebOS because it was such a great technical achievement and a great, I would say, user experience achievement. You know, the early hardware was a little underpowered, um, but I, looking at Palma of that day, I think they just simply ran out of money. And I think this is something that when you look at that first pre and the first version of WebOS and their ideas, um, you know, the HTML and uh, web-based programming model and all that, I thought, you know, really neat. You know, they had multitasking from day one and so forth. Nice stuff, but obviously they have uh, not done so well in the market. So HP Snap snatched them up, and they announced this week their plans for this year for WebOS. So there's going to be two smartphones, including a replacement for the Pre and then a brand new phone called the Veer. But of course, what everyone's talking about is this iPad lookalike, you know, the the touchpad. And I have to say, it looks interesting. Uh, we'll have to see what the iPad 2 looks like before we can really draw, I think, a good comparison because the touchpad is significantly lighter than today's iPad, but the story is that the iPad 2 will also be lighter. It's got the same size screen, you know, 9.7 inches, same resolution. Um, it's got a fast, slightly faster processor, not that that matters, so the different OSs anyway. 16 to 32 gigs of storage. But when you look at this kind of a device and you look at the iPad or, you know, the projected iPad 2 that should be announced anytime now, um, you know, the RIM playbook, and um, am, I, am I missing one? I feel like I'm missing one. Oh, and of course, Zoom. oh, yeah, right. oh and I was going to say, oh, the 1,000 Android-based tablets that are going to come right. out this year uh, based on, on Honeycomb. You know, these things all, they're all very similar, right? Um, I, they're, they're all very interesting. I, I guess I, I would say, you know, having written off WebOS, um, you know, you look at the demos of this tablet and how they do the multitasking, which is very similar to the phone. You know, the email application that is very, very, very similar uh, to the mail application on the iPad. Um, there's not, a, they're all very similar, aren't they? I mean, you know, last year we didn't have a lot of choice, real, like good choice in the, in the tablet market such as it is, or such as, such as it was last year. This year, we're going to have a lot of choices and they all look pretty high quality. I mean, they all look really good. And uh, like, as we've highlighted before, there aren't a lot of, you know, Windows options in there, but um, lost amid all the excitement over HP is that uh, Dell also announced this week a, a Windows 7-based tablet, uh, by which I mean a Slate-style tablet, i.e. a uh, iPad-type tablet. Um, not a lot of information about that. It looks a lot like their, um, their Streak tablets, except Windows-based. It looks, uh, I think it's an, I don't remember the exact, I, I want to say it's a 9.7 or 10-inch screen. Yeah, it's just under 10. You can round, yeah. you can round it and make it 10-inch. 10 10 inch. 10 inches, yeah. So we don't know anything about this thing, uh, how much it weighs, how much the battery life's going to be, whether they've got some kind of custom UI on top of it, which I have to think is a prerequisite for anything for Windows. Um, you know, but hopefully Dell or somebody will get that right this year, too. And then between all this stuff, a lot of which isn't shipping till the summer, so we still have months to go, you know, to make an, uh, a fair comparison. Uh, this year is really shaping up to be an amazing thing for the, for the tablets. And I think it's what we expected last year and didn't get. But now we're going to see it this year. Do, do you 20. think, I, I'm starting to form this opinion, and I'm not sure yet what I think of it, but I, I, I'm, do you think that it doesn't matter as much on a tablet what the underlying operating system is? Uh, unlike iTunes, iPhone, which was so tied to iPod and a huge advantage, I don't feel yeah. like the tablet has that advantage because you, it's more about well, using apps. And so it's about the app ecosystem. Yeah, well, and, but that is, that's, but that's the lock-in issue right there, right? So if you're an iPhone user, iPod user, iPod Touch especially, um, 
and you're, you've been in this ecosystem and you've bought the apps, and many of which work just fine on the, uh, on the iPad or have you know, those special EXE types with an iPad version you get from the same program, uh, that's incentive to stick with the iPad. You know, if you're an iPad user today, I, I can't imagine any of these people are going to upgrade or side grade or whatever they call it or you know, mm -hmm. move to uh, some competing tablet. Um, the mar but that's not the market, right? The, the big market for these things are new users, people who want to use these as a replacement for a PC, which is increasingly popular for mainstream users, or want to use it as a PC companion, which I think will also be a big deal. So you have to look at the ecosystem, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, I think the usage model on these non-PC tablets are all going to be very similar. You know, if you look at those HP demos, it's iPad-esque, isn't it? I mean, our, yeah. you know, the honeycomb stuff, it's all very similar. It's, it, you, if you understand the basics, you know, there's going to be a mail app on all these things and a calendar app, and there are going to be games and apps and, and web browsers and all that. So now, I what, think they all serve a uh, similar purpose. One of the functional differences that I see, and I've noticed this most on the playbook, although I, I haven't got my hands on it, it looks like WebOS has this too, is better... Mm -hmm true multitasking yeah, and they always than have. Android and iOS have, which is a big advantage. I, I, yeah, I would get so frustrated that on the iPad. I spent some time evaluating uh, the, the current iPad earlier this year to determine whether it makes sense for people who travel for work and, 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 my, and for my needs in particular. And I run into an issue where, you know, I often have a, a web browser with multiple tabs open on one side, and then I'll have a, a word processing document over here. And, and having them side by side is nice, but Honestly, especially in a laptop, I often have these things full screen and I'm switching between them. It's very easy to do that on a PC or a Mac, you know, like a traditional personal computer. But on an iPad, it's not very easy. No. Because there's no back and, and there's, no, there's no easy motion to switch between running apps. I know there's a way to open up the little shelf there and, and pick the app, but it's, it's a little more awkward. And if you're the type of person who wants to be typing, as I am, you know, touching the screen or the one button on the screen to get to that and then navigating the thing, it's not as seamless. So it's very easy on a personal computer to be typing, flip it over, look at something, flip it back, type some more. Um, it's a very simple uh, mechanism and, and it just doesn't exist in those things. Now, I'm also the minority, though. I mean, that doesn't matter to most people. But I, I, I've only, it's been a while since I've used that WebOS model for multitasking. But I do remember it being very seamless and kind of excellent. And, and also, I would say lo logical enough. I don't want to call it uh, um, intuitive necessarily. But, you know, it's one of those things, once you see how it works, um, it makes plenty of sense. And it looks, it makes the iOS style multitasking look a little more awkward, you know, by comparison or unwieldy, I guess. It, it, iOS is not multitasking. It's pausing rather than closing. Yeah. I mean, I, I the use case I use is when I prepare for tech news today, what I do is I look through my RSS reader for stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I And when I find one I want to consider in the lineup, I yep. copy that link, copy the yep. title, put it over in a spreadsheet uh, right. to save it. Uh, mm -hmm. And on an, on a laptop, it's you know, yeah, bing, 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 highlight, bing, bing, control C, you know, control V, you know, boom, 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 boom. On an iPad, it's right, you know, well, even painfully like, consider, highlight, then let, let's, double I mean, let's, click the button, yeah, then it, uh, tap right. the Safari, and open up the Google Doc, <laughs> and it reloads right. every time. Even so, though right. it's supposedly so multitasking. Yeah, you only do it once before you realize it's not good enough. Yeah, right? yeah. Even if you relegated what you just described to a single app, you know, if you said, well, I'm going to use Google Reader inside of the Safari app on the iPad, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to try to open the links in a new browser tab I've every time. I've tried that, yeah. That's actually worse. Even, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's still, it's still horrible, right? So, and I, this is not an, uh, an indictment of iOS per se. It's just, you know, these things are designed for more of a mainstream audience that does one thing at a time, frankly, that's for the it. most part. That's exactly it. I, I, iPad is great at one thing at a time. It's not very good at two or more. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. I, and don't take that as a criticism. It's just the way it is. I mean, I, I think these things will evolve over time. But when you look at how WebOS does it, you know, that forgotten mobile OS, uh, it's nice. You know, so maybe that will be a better model. We'll, we'll see. I, I think the way this is going to work out is at the end of the year, we'll be able to construct our little tables and say, you know, here's where the iPad is better. Here's where the Honeycomb stuff is better. Here's where uh, HP is better or whatever. And you can make that list. And then there's not, you can't say this is, this one device is always going to be better. It's going to depend on your needs. 
And so that's the type of stuff we're going to have to evaluate this year as we look at these things. Before we move off of this real quickly, uh, mm -hmm. they almost, almost as, a, as an offhand remark, mentioned that they would be coming out with uh, WebOS on PCs. I know, I and know. Then, and then clarified that later to a reporter that they meant WebOS as a skin on Windows 7 machines. They actually said that. Oh, I had that idea. Yeah, heard. yeah. I can't remember if that was in Gadget that I read that on. Uh, yeah, that, I, that I hadn't heard. Uh, I, I took their, this is, a, this is a platform play by this company, and they're one of the few, you know, tech companies that are big enough maybe to make it work. I'm not saying it's going to work. Uh, WebOS has been no success of any kind from a sales perspective at all so far, but HP has got a lot of money and uh, a lot of market power and all that. So uh, maybe, you know, that would be an interesting break with Microsoft if they did decide, you know, uh, you could almost see them doing it in a tiered way. We'll offer some kind of a web OS interface on top of Windows 7 tablet, right, which would give you the best of both worlds. And then the next step would be if they sell enough of those, well, now here's a web OS, you know, PC or whatever. Um, yeah. You never know. Yeah, that's true. You never do. All right. Uh, because you never know, you need our <laughs> next sponsor. Carbonite, because you never know when a disaster is going to strike. I am being backed up right now. I just checked by Carbonite, back up in progress, had no idea that it was going on. And that's the beauty of it. With Carbonite, you just set it up. It backs up your files on your PC or your Mac. It's safe. It's easy. And it keeps you peaceful in your mind. Because you don't have to worry that if there's a power outage or a hard drive crash or or something horrible happens, your data is all gone, and you're going to have to take it to some expensive hard drive recovery organization uh, or just give up the data for lost, Carbonite helps you keep that peace of mind by having it backed up automatically in the background. It's safe, it's secure, it's easy to use, and it's automatic. I suggest, I always suggest to people have a local backup that you do and have a cloud backup so that you're redundantly backed up. And for, for the cloud backup, I use Carbonite. Uh, you get your files back with just a few clicks. And it has the added benefit if you're not on your computer and you're not around that local hard drive, you can actually still access all those files that are backed up uh, over the web, uh, on your iPhone, on your BlackBerry. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fantastic side benefit, and those are free apps for your phone. So if you back it up, you can get it back from wherever you are with Carbonite. Unlimited backup for your PC Mac or Mac is only $55 a year. That's just 15 cents a day. And if you decide to buy the service after a free trial that we're going to give you, you'll get two months free. Just use the offer code WINDOWS. Go to Carbonite.com. Try it out for free. Use the offer code WINDOWS. And if you decide to keep it, uh, sign. make sure you sign up for the free trial from the homepage. And you'll get two months free. You don't need a credit card to try it. So go ahead, Carbonite.com. You can do it while you're listening to Windows Weekly. Offer code Windows. This next story, I don't <laughs> believe. Okay. You're, you're saying Zune has gained on iTunes? Just, I, I didn't. That's a very. That's a very general statement. I, but the. <laughs> does this mean people stopped using iTunes? No. 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 All right. What's going on here? No. So first of all, this is specifically for video downloads, which means uh, movie and TV show purchases and rentals uh, through the respective services, right? iTunes, Zoom Marketplace, also uh, Sony's PlayStation stores uh, factors into this as well. Oh, okay. And other, pl other players. Um, and it's not unit sales or whatever that means, you know, <laughs> rentals or downloads or it's actually uh, revenue. So iTunes actually grew in 2010 from a revenue perspective, and I'm sure from a usage share perspective, it's just that these other services actually grew faster and thus gained share on Apple. So, for example, um, iTunes video revenue share uh, was six. Let's see, I'm sorry, 74 percent, let's say, in 2009, but it but fell to 64.5 percent in 2010. So, the Zoom marketplace saw a a jump at the same time period from 11.6 percent to 17.9 percent. So they're actually almost a 20% of the market. Um, the company that did this research is a company I've never heard of, which should make it sound a little more dubious, but it's called IHS Screen Digest. And they also note that uh, Sony's PlayStation Store was uh, number three. They grew from 5.7% of the market to 7.2%. Now, this doesn't involve streaming services uh, such as that owned by Netflix, uh, which you have to think it was uh, fairly dominant from a, from a revenue perspective as well. 
And, uh, and they also have a caveat to this, which is that, you know, they feel like Walmart has a chance through their partnership with Voodoo to uh, really impact this market and maybe be a, at least a number two player to iTunes sometime in the near future, even though today they're almost nothing. It was interesting looking at that report, and they're like, yeah, you know, so I, iTunes is growing, but Zoom and, Zoom and PS3 are, are in the in the hunt, and they've actually got some real competition, so we think Walmart is going to be big. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Sort of that. came out of left field there. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like, exactly. I, I, love the, I love the rationale behind that. But, uh, you know, okay, fair enough. Um, they, they noted that, you know, the Zoom marketplace stuff uh, grew because of Xbox in a large way. And I, I think that thanks to the Kinect uh, in part, you know, people, and, and also it should be noted that, you know, that new Xbox console that came out last year, you know, people are finally putting these things in their living room and then using them, right? Because one of the problems with the original Xbox, it was so loud and um, uh, just t terrible as a set-top box, you know. Whereas now uh, you've got this multifunction device and you can do things on it other than play video games. And, uh, and, and if you haven't done it, actually, I mean, you know, the Zoom experience on Xbox 360 for, with regards to, you know, buying or renting TV shows and movies is actually really good. It's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice little system. I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm surprised by this. I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I never expected <laughs> the Zoom stuff to ever uh, own any kind of share of any kind of market. So that's neat. I mean, I, and they deserve it. I, it's it's actually really good technology. So The takeaway here is we're talking about the Zune marketplace, not the Zune device. And yeah. Xbox is the biggest oh. chunk of that. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, the, I, and the secondary headline here is what this means is iTunes used to have all the marketplace. Now they have no, competition. They have most of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, as in so many things in my life, I, I can look at the headlines that were generated from the story and you can see, you can see the interesting bias uh, of different places. So for example, you know, how do you report on a story like this? I, my take on it is Zoom gained, you know, market share from iTunes with regards to videos. I mean, I think that's the only way you could potentially see this, but a lot of the headlines from kind of the Apple oriented site said iTunes still dominant yeah. in, you know, they, but they, I mean, they fell pretty dramatically. I, I they are, I get, they are still dominant. Yes. But I think it's impressive uh, for something like Zoom, which has, I think zero brand recognition or at, you know, possibly negative brand recognition um, to have done that well is, I think, is actually pretty notable. All right, let's move on to the rumor of the week. Now, do you mind if I throw one that somebody in the chat room just just tossed at me from Mary Jo Foley? Sure. Microsoft's Windows Phone 7 Mango update to get IE Mobile 9. Is there any, have you heard anything about that? Yeah, I've already, that's not, a, that's true. Oh, okay. That's, I've, I've, that's, I've, I've already, that's true I've and old. That. Good. Yep. Let's have a yep. real rumor then. What do you got? <laughs> okay, uh, Mango, by the way, is the is the uh, V2 version of Windows Phone 7. So it's it's supposed to ship a year from the general availability of the first version, i.e., October of this year. And and IE9 uh, mobile is only part of it. But yeah, that's a, a that's that's a known that's a known thing. So uh, the rumor this week is that Microsoft. The big rumor this week, I guess, the rumor of the decade of the week, or whatever however you want to say it is that uh, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, is getting ready to, and has in fact, yes, I, apparently in the past started it, uh, a massive reorg of the upper management ranks of Microsoft. And what he wants to do is replace people who are sort of marketing focused with people who are engineering focused or technologists, right? Um, the irony behind this in many ways is that uh, Steve Ballmer himself yeah, comes from the marketing side of the company and is not a technologist or an engineer himself. And that one of the big controversies when he assumed control of the company was that Microsoft for the first time was not run by somebody with a technology background like Bill Gates. Uh, it was now being run by a marketeer. And, um, you know, we can debate how the past decade has gone for Microsoft. Obviously, there are um, things you can look at that make, make it look positive and there are things you can look at that make it look negative. But I, I drew a <laughs> perhaps controversial Comparison, I, I compared uh, Steve Ballmer to uh, President Mubarak of Egypt, right, who's also fighting uh, to Isn't keep his own. Isn't that something like Godwin's Law? Yeah. Is there some analog for that now for Egypt? It, yeah, yeah. And, and, but but and, yes, I realize it's because it's in the news and all that. But think about it. You know, this is a guy who wants to stay in power. And everyone around him in the outside world is saying, we need to replace this guy. Mm -hmm. And his reaction is, I have heard what you said, and I'm replacing everyone below me. Does that satisfy your demands? Right. <laughs> you know, see if so, the, see if the crowd disperses. In this case, yeah, of stockholders. Right. So, I, I mean, who can say? You know, I, I don't know that what he wants to do is 
going to solve the problem. I, I don't, I don't know, and I'm not saying that bringing back someone like Bill Gates or bringing back Bill Gates or putting someone who is an engineer in charge of the company is going to fix all the problems either. But it is an interesting reaction. And I, it, when you look at some of the executives who have left Microsoft in recent months, particularly Bob Muglia, you have to think that this was part of this. You know, uh, although Muglia actually was an engineer um, and certainly was one of the more successful um, uh, division heads at Microsoft too. Uh, so that his his replace or his uh, walking away from the company kind of confuses me. I, somebody had speculated to me that uh, perhaps Balmer had gone to him and said, "Look, we're putting someone over you. You know, uh, in charge. You know that we'll, you'll be under someone else now, and uh, this will be a cloud guy or whatever." And he just rejected that. So they said, "Okay, well, you know, we'll accept your resignation." And I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I, I, it, I, all signs point to something big is going to be happening with regards to this. And I've heard, you know, the reorg stuff, this goes back some months and I, and which makes me wonder if a lot of these executives who have left have been leaving because of this, you know, because this has been a long planned thing that uh, they're, they're starting to figure out who the right people are. And of course the people who are in charge of different divisions now or different product groups within Microsoft don't like the way that uh, they're being uh, shunted aside and maybe they're just leaving now before they get canned or before they just, or run into some job they're not interested in having. So I guess we'll see. Maybe Stephen Elop will be the new CEO of the joined Microsoft Nokia conglomerate. Yes, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if you can get over that hump of Nokia and Microsoft merging, <laughs> if that, so, you know, it's like, yeah, that's actually, a big fish to swallow, but then it, say, that could I, actually I, make some sense. I have a bigger belief that those companies could merge than I do that Stephen Elop would become the guy in charge because... Yeah. Stephen Elop wasn't actually at Microsoft for all that long. Um, you know, he basically oversaw the the uh, creation of Office 2010, if I'm not mistaken, and I think that was it. I, I think he came into that job at Office between 20, you know, Office 20, uh, 2007 and 2010. I, I don't think he has a long term. I'd have to go back and look it up, but I, I don't believe he was there for a long, long time. So I, I think that it would be highly unlikely for Microsoft to essentially hire from the outside for the top job. And I think it's potentially highly unlikely that they would even consider replacing Balmer too. But Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, Balmer would have to go for for any anything else to happen. And and Balmer is going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming out of that. I, I said this on Tech News Today the other day. I really yep. believe that Stephen Balmer absolutely loves Microsoft. I mean, he yep. that oh, has oh, been absolutely. his only oh, job. Yeah, yeah. And no, he's and, not he's not undermining the company from the inside or anything. No, at least no. not purposely. And every executive says, "Oh, I love this company," until they retire with a golden parachute and go on to the next one. I think Balmer is one of the few exceptions where he's like, "No, it, it is his life blood, and he he will yeah. not give it up easily." You no, know, imagine uh, you know, uh, this, and we're going to have to make this very general and, and and not get into any details. But imagine if you could break up Microsoft into two or three companies, whatever it might be. And imagine all the groups of people who would benefit from this. It would be everyone, virtually. It would be, you know, customers because it would be increased competition and uh, speed to market and so forth. Uh, shareholders would benefit because they would own a piece of each of these companies. Like who, but but who wouldn't benefit from that, right? Basically, Steve Ballmer wouldn't benefit from that. Right? I mean, right. uh, he would be the one guy that would stand to lose by a move that I would argue I think would benefit customers and, and it is really all I'm concerned about, but would also benefit shareholders and, and so forth. Um, so... You know, unfortunately, a guy like that, and it's not because he's a bad guy or a bad manager. I'm not even I'm not even suggesting that he should be replaced. It's just that when you think about these big moves, you know, unfortunately, the blocker is always going to be that guy, you know, and maybe a small team of people around him. And, um, you know, if, if you do believe that these things should happen, then it sort of is unfortunate because, of course, this guy can prevent that from happening. He just doesn't entertain the notion. Yeah. You know, things would have to go seriously south at the company for the, sh the board of directors to seek some kind of an ouster and God knows what the requirements for that to go through would be or whatever. I mean, for these conversations to even start, something horrible would have to happen to this company. And, and for all the bad stuff that's happened, let's remember, they generate cash. I mean, they mint money. So I just don't see it happening. I think the danger of what Balmer's doing here is not that he's doing the wrong thing. I think it's very smart to put engineers back in charge of things. Uh, in some respect, but Balmer, being an extreme guy, may go too far and put engineers in charge of too many things. 
Uh, sure. You know, I mean, engineers should be in charge of, of products and give an engineering perspective on things. I've seen this happen in a, a, many companies. Some I've worked for, some, some I've just observed <laughs> from the outside, where the people who tend to rise into executive positions are people who are good at talking. People who are good at persuading. And engineers sure. are, are not those people. And editors yeah. and writers and people who work on products are not those people. They're focused on the thing they're working on. But salespeople and marketing people, their job is talking and influencing. And so they're good at that. And, and yeah. companies have to sort of fight against that. So I, I admire what he's doing here saying, you know what, I want to fight against that because I think it's working against us. But you, could, you can take it too far. You know, you've, you've reminded me of two things. One of which is that, you know, when Microsoft was experiencing hyper growth, um, which is only possible when you're a small company on the way up, right? But w when that was happening for the first, let's say, 20 years or 15 years of Microsoft's existence, whatever it was, uh, it was an engineering driven company, right? So on the face of things, you could look at that and say, well, maybe that, maybe that is the way to go. But I, I actually don't believe that that's the way to go when you're a, mo a bigger, more mature company. But you know, it's a very generic thing to say, but um, may, I, hopefully that's not the rationale behind it. Um, knowing Microsoft, though, as well as we do, and, and understanding the multiple layers of hierarchy that exist there and the, uh, the ranks of executives and all the different product groups and everything, it occurs to me, <laughs> and this, is, this, is, uh, this would be funny if it wasn't so possible, um, I could almost picture this guy, and this would be such a Microsoft thing to do to insist that there will always be two people in charge of every product group. One uh -huh. will be a marketeer right. and one will be an engineer and that these guys will somehow share responsibility. Oh yeah. And, uh, and that is, that's a beautiful recipe for never getting anything done. Oh yeah. I've, and I've, I've seen that. I've seen that idea put in place before to yeah. horrible effect every time. But once that, that thought enters your head, yeah. you almost could see, the, I mean, this sounds like something Microsoft would do. It's a, it's a so, great idea. It's an awesome idea. Yeah. We'll, what get could the, go wrong? we'll get the best of both people and no decisions. Right. All right. Uh, we've got our uh, picks of the week coming up, but uh, I want to thank our other sponsor for Windows Weekly this week, FreshBooks. Uh, I actually need to use this, and I am going to use this immediately because I, I've, I've had to start doing some invoices here and there, and I had no idea what a pain in the ass it is to do an invoice. <laughs> you know, I, I whipped something together that was serviceable, uh, but FreshBooks, what it, what it does is says, look, we'll take care of all of that hard part of formatting and knowing what, what information you need to have on there. We'll quickly and easily create and send professional looking invoices you upload your company logo to appear on the invoice give them that professional look give them that customized look then your clients can download a pdf of the invoice or uh you can even have a, a printed version mailed to them with your return address and everything printed on it for a little bit extra uh you receive your payments for your invoices directly through FreshBooks. they can pay via paypal and 11 other electronic payment services or use their credit card uh automated late payment reminders if you invoice by the hour, there's a time tracking feature. Two million users have been sending and paying invoices with FreshBooks since 2004. So try it out for free. They have a monthly program that's free if you only have three clients. Uh, you know, if you're somebody like me, it's like, I don't invoice all the time, but I would like to take advantage of this. Take advantage for three, up to three clients. It takes about a minute to set up an account. Go to FreshBooks.com and sign up. Uh, and when, you ask, when you're asked how you heard about FreshBooks, be sure to enter the offer code WINDOWS. Uh, now, it's already free for the three clients to try it out, but if you enter the offer code WINDOWS, FreshBooks is giving away a cake, a birthday cake, <laughs> to one of their a audience cake. members every month. Yeah. Oh, I'm signing up now. I need Fre a cake. FreshBook.com. That's not going to fit with your diet, Paul. FreshBooks.com. Offer code. I almost said offer code cake. Offer code WINDOWS. They'll give you a cake. So 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 a free a free monthly uh, a free monthly trial for three clients that's that's just given, but because you watch this show, you might get a cake, and the cake is not a lie in this case. Cake is absolutely I, the, the cake was never a lie. I want to be very clear about that. They're calling it a birthday cake, but it doesn't have to be your birthday if you win. Sure, it's just a birthday style cake. Check it out, <laughs> FreshBooks.com. <laughs> Offer code Windows. We thank you for their support. I, I'm I'm definitely trying out FreshBooks. That that if you do any kind of invoicing, uh, and on your own, that's that's amazing. That's good stuff. <laughs> All right, let's get to uh, Windows Phone app of the week. Big one, big one for Windows Phone this week. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in many ways, a lot of these app picks are just we're ticking off that list of those uh, favorite iPhone or Android apps that you know are finally making their way to 
Windows Phone. But of course, the, the reason we're mentioning them is they're so useful, at least to me in this case. Is And, and this week is uh, the Amazon app. And just as a little tip, if you're searching for this on the phone, because the, the phone search is so terrible, um, type in Amazon application to find it, because otherwise you'll get a list that's... Uh, you know, 30 or 50 items long, and it's way down near the bottom. So, love Windows Phone. But anyway, <laughs> the uh, Amazon app, of course, brings the Amazon shopping experience to the phone. And it does so, and it's a very simple interface. It's got the, uh, it's not a panoramic app per se, but it, it has a, um, you know, a couple of different screens you can flip through and search capabilities and all that. But I typically, that's actually the Kindle app you're showing, by the way, not the Amazon app. See, that's the problem. Yeah, right. You'll never find it. That's the problem. But you, you, you'll find it eventually. Just keep looking. <laughs> it's not, it's in there somewhere, I promise. Um, I, I You know, my typical use, by the way, for both the Amazon app and for the Kindle app is I'll be out in the real world very occasionally. I hate leaving the house. But when when I do, I'll be in some store and I'll always, you know, rather depending on what it is, rather than buy it locally, uh, like a good citizen, I'll look it up on Amazon to see if I can get it cheaper. Or in the case of a book, of course, on the Kindle, perhaps. Um, and unfortunately, that is the use I <laughs> yeah, most often uh, use these things for. But it's just kind of a nice uh, experience, and you can attach it to your one-click account and all that stuff. So if you have, uh, you know, Prime shipping like I do, whatever, you buy something with the app, and uh, when you're out on the road, and then it will arrive at home automatically. So it's it's a nicely done little app. And Gadget took the opportunity to uh, mock it up in a Nokia phone, by the way, which I thought was kind of clever. <laughs> Everybody else is showing it on an actual Windows phone, but... I, I would hope if this little merger or whatever it is or combining of the wills goes through that whatever resulting Windows 7 phone does come down the pike from Nokia hopefully looks nothing like their existing phones. Although maybe that maybe that is the point. Yeah. Maybe it, maybe they want it to look like their existing phones because that's what their customers like. All right. Well, our software pick of the week will be familiar to listeners of the show mm -hmm. earlier. Allow me to once again reiterate the many benefits of <laughs> Internet Explorer 9 RC. No, so the release candidate is out today. And again, you could, uh, I think it's beautytheweb.com, ietestdrive.com, and also microsoft.com slash ie uh, will get you to that. You need to have Vista or Windows 7. And again, the experience is so much better on Windows 7, as is life in general. Um, so, I, you know, again, I've only been using it for a couple of days, but it looks solid and uh, they've made some nice improvements in the RC, so. Do check it out. All right. Well, uh, that sadly brings us uh, to the conclusion of our, our Windows Weekly. Although I need you to clarify something. Uh, yes. we, we moved on really quickly, but you, you, you wanted to make clear that the cake was never a lie. Yeah. So if you're familiar with the game Portal, um, which has some uh, still unresolved connections to the Half-Life universe, um, there's a, a crazy computer program that is uh, kind of goading you on, and she gets crazier and crazier as the game goes on. And one of the things she tries to get you to move forward with is the promise of a cake. And, uh, you know, as you kind of break out of the testing system and tunnel through the, you know, the internals of this uh, bu building you're in, underground building, um, you see things scratched in the wall from other people who also tried to escape that says the cake is a lie. But actually, if you play the game all the way through, you get that awesome song at the end, the Jim Colton. Uh, Jim Colton? Jonathan Colton. Guy? Jonathan Colton. Yeah. And uh, there's a cake. In there, so the cake is not a lie. There is, in fact, a birthday cake at the end of the game. But you don't get it. Well, you do kind of get it. I mean, as the you know, I well, mean, you know, I guess I get the player. She has it. The cake, but the cake, it, but the cake is there. So that's the point. In other words, there is a cake. It's just you're not going to get it. You may not get it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, author of Windows Phone Secrets, uh, well, of course, news editor for Windows IT Pro and uh, WinSuperSite.com. Uh, anything else uh, to to mention along those lines before we go? No, but, you know, Portal 2 is coming out soon. Ah, uh, yes. It's an so April it'll... release now, is that right? I was just wondering that. I don't remember. I yeah, hope it's It was that supposed soon. to be February, and then they delayed it. I think they delayed it till April. It reminds me of, if you're familiar with the Crackdown games on Xbox 360, the new one almost looks too realistic. You uh -huh. know, the, the, pre the previous game was very Half-Life-esque as far as the graphic quality, Half-Life 2, you know. Uh, the new one looks, you know... Serious. I mean, yeah. it looks uh, very, very realistic. So we'll, well see it, how it's it in the, It's in the, uh, uh, a future where the testing facility, you know, after you conclude a mm -hmm. portal, right, you, every, yeah. everything is broken. So this is, right. it's a little overgrown and everything. It looks great. So I, I, got, <laughs> I got to, I got to, I didn't get to play it, but I got to oh, see it played it. at CES oh. uh, by one of the guys who worked on it. 
Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And and he was you know showing off. He was showing off a, an a axis controller, six axis controller. Uh, okay, uh, but, but they were using some playable levels. Uh, to it's show a it. smart game. You know, it's yeah. a it's a puzzle game essentially, but it's uh, you know three dimensional and uh, it's a lot of you know warping through things and you know it, it's a smart game. It's a it's a fun. Uh, thing and I did you know I did it uh, on my own and then my son tried to do it and was uh, needed some help so it was kind of a nice uh, father son moment as well you know so it's it that's a nice little game I hope this I hope the second one is as good I, and you can get it on Steam now too yeah, yeah. it's all over the place it's you, on the 360 I, I, it's on yeah, Steam yeah. it was it, it was it's I think it's super cheap on Steam too if I'm not mistaken. yeah there 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 have been some sales I ended up buying it again on Steam even though I had it for Xbox just because yeah I did the so same cheap. thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, I will be back thank again you. one more time next week, uh, and then Leo Laporte will be back in two weeks. That's yeah, it for Windows Week? That's right. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Play this. Yeah. I believe we're doing this on Friday. Oh, no, no, next week we're not. I'm sorry. That's not true. Never mind. Okay. Next week is the normal time. Pay no attention to that. <laughs> That's it for Windows Week. I, I just think out loud. <laughs> we'll see you next time. By the way, just for your edification, I, I heard from some farmers who said, you know, by the way, I own cows and they do eat corn. But as I was able to explain to them, uh, that's because uh, today's most of today's cows in America are the result of uh, years and years of breeding. And they've been breeding them towards being able to eat, uh, eat corn. And that, um, you know, the, the, the cows I was talking about that are kept to a, a state of sickness are, you know, feedlot cows. And unfortunately, that is, uh, unfortunately, what I said last week was very accurate. Um, and, you know, whatever. I posted a little thing on Facebook about it because I did hear, it was funny to hear from people who are farmers, you know. Um, I own a cow and I don't know what you're talking about. They love my, corn. My cow's eating corn right now. Is my, eating corn right now. My yeah. cow eats but, popcorn. And, and I said, I just hope you're not going to be eating that Franken cow because uh, <laughs> that meat is very unhealthy. What should we call this episode? I don't know. I don't like. I, I let me. I know. I've I've, I've, I've asked you that before, and you're like, I, I don't get to do that. Can I can I get it? Can I get a vote? Can I get a vote? <laughs> I don't know how to name episodes. I don't know. I would call it Nokia and Microsoft sitting in a tree. <laughs> I don't know. The corn is a lie. We didn't talk about the corn in the actual. The corn show. is a lie. Um, yeah. Cake is never a lie. Cake is never a lie. Zoom dominates iTunes. That's nice. I like that. <laughs>